OK, guys, can you hear me? So it seems the audio is working, so very good. So let's start. Uh, so my name is Indrich Novi, and I'm from the site uh, Reliability Engineering in Red Hat. And so uh, these days, you had a lot of uh, presentations about how to implement the operators, how to try the new OpenShift or Kubernetes. Uh, but what we do at the moment, we are trying to keep our current installation uh, working at, stale, at, uh, at the scale. So I'm going to. Uh, talk about this today. I'm not going to uh, do too much into technical details, but I will focus on the way how we maintain stuff and how we should, uh, if you happen to have multiple clusters, uh, which kind of tools you can use uh, and how can you actually maintain it uh, at scale. So in the first part, I will describe what, what is our current offering, what we actually do, uh, and what kind of products do we offer. Uh, in the second uh, a part of presentation, I will describe how the OpenShift SREs are actually working within Red Hat, what they do. And in the last part, I will have a live presentation of a tool um, which we uh, currently run as a proof concept for uh, audited work on production clusters. So let me start with a brief description of what we offer. So uh, we are having multiple tiers or products, I would say. Oh. <laughs> and so we are having the OpenShift online when you, when you can yourself try uh, let's say to run one project is not much because uh, it's for free <laughs> and it's not supported, but at least you, you can give it a try. So um, there, there is a way how to uh, actually run it. And uh, if you go more serious, you can go uh, OpenShift Online Pro, which is a small fee of $50 per month. And you can run after uh, about approximately 10 projects uh, in this offering. And you are also receiving some basic support, uh, which is very limited but still sufficient for maintenance of the cluster, I would say. Um, and I see actually many colleagues of myself here, uh, so you know, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and uh, this is actually the product where uh, Red Hat uh, has most money from. It's OpenShift dedicated cluster. Um, it runs on the public cloud. Most of the exposure is actually currently in AWS. And um, it provides um, you know, the hosting of your private cloud as well as uh, maintenance of the whole cluster. Uh, that includes uh, you know, upgrading of cluster, uh, patching for security vulnerabilities, but that's basically it, you know, uh, and handling breakages. Um, the, uh, the pods, your, your actual workload, the applications you run in the cluster is completely uh, on you, right? So it's more or less working in the way that basically you just opt in into some cluster, we maintain it for you, and you just run your stuff and don't care about maintenance. Um, the last offering is the uh, OpenShift container platform, uh, which is convenient for um, setups like banks or something like this, because uh, they can run their own cluster on premises. So we don't need to really uh, go AWS, or uh, they can even have their own uh, cloud environment. And so this is our current offering. Um, so as I said, uh, we, we, we take care about master infrastructure and compute nodes managed by Red Hat. And uh, there is also the support, so you can file us a ticket, and, and we will be very happy, mostly, to, so, to sort it for you, sometimes. Um, so I want to show you also what's in the package, because you know it's easy to say, like, hey, guys, here you go with the support. But what kind of support do we have? Um, so this one is kind of questionable, because it's kind of a feature of Kubernetes itself um, that is highly available. So uh, if you have any workload, um, uh, we can uh, actually offer you quite a big uh, uptime because Kubernetes is, if you have, let's say, stateless pods most of the time, uh, it handles high availability itself. Uh, if you have multiple clouds, uh, we are able to set up the peering connections uh, in the virtual private cloud. So you can have very heterogeneous environment uh, and only one dedicated cluster in which you give it a try. Uh, then the premium support uh, is granting like 99.5 uptime SLA. Uh, which I calculated like one day uh, downtime, uh, which I think might be dedicated to, uh, let's say, major um, version upgrades and stuff like that. Um, there, you can you can use various authenticity providers, um, LDAP, you know, GitHub, you name it, and you can also get the internal uh, per cl uh, internal cluster container registry. So what you can do uh, is you can build your own images, you can uh, deploy on top of that your workloads. Um, this one is very important, so logging metrics and monitoring, because uh, then you will have also uh, some overview of what, what you're actually running and uh, how, it do, how it's doing. 
Now I need to uh, tell you a story. Um, I was working in a hedge fund, and I was given a task. Um, my task was to build the operating systems for the platform. And um, one day I went to the, uh, uh, <laughs> I went to the office and I started to build a completely new operating system, which was Rails 7 at the time. And this particular operating system uh, was very quirky and it failed most of the time. And it needs a while to, to build. So what I did, uh, I triggered the build, I set up the boot server, and I went for lunch. When I returned back from the lunch, uh, it was really interesting because uh, I see my host is not running Rails 7 at all. It was running Rails 6. And so I asked my colleague, hey, what's wrong? You know, how come that there's no Rails 7 on my host? And he was like, don't worry, Magic Fairies fixed it for you. Right? <laughs> And I realized that we are having um, some engineers who are getting triggered or you know, having a page alert uh, in case something goes wrong. And what went wrong in the particular uh, thing that I configured was that actually I Pixie switched the cluster and the Kickstarter didn't go well. So basically you know, it was looped in the Pixie, uh, Pixie boot and it was kind of trashing the boot server. And so the operational part of the plant received the alert. He Pixie, Pixie switched that. Uh, it was Bob, so he was, you know, a little bit like this, saying, "Oh, not this guy again." <laughs> and uh, then he's basically he, um, he switched it back to the functional state. And um, I am going with the fairies because nobody really thinks who is actually handling this stuff most of the time, also on, in, in, on the cluster. And so I want to briefly survive, how, uh, you know, briefly describe how the SRE, SRE OpenShift uh, is working. So. We are, uh, we are following the follow the sun kind of approach. So we're having three regions at the time. So we are having uh, NASA, EMEA, and APEC region. And um, the reason is very simple. We are having 24 hours. And you know one uh, work, work shift is eight hours. And so what uh, the SRE is doing is uh, break fix. So if, if it's a critical alert, uh, we need to fix it. Uh, we need to do maintenances and customer inquiries and issues. Um, we are having different roles. Uh, which actually switches every week. And so these roles, roles are shift lead. So this is um, you know, the unfortunate guy who is receiving most of the alerts on his cell phone and uh, is, is being, being very busy uh, resolving critical issues. Um, the, the shift secondary is the other, other SRE at the time uh, who is uh, handling, uh, let's say, the incident queue. And also uh, he's... Uh, uh, interacting with the with, with the with the second level support uh, to resolve issues, um, and the reason why we have two of such of these people is because if the shift lead, um, I don't know, is in a restroom or something, he cannot take the alerts. The secondary can take over, right? Um, then actually we have on call person. Um, if anything fails from these two, there is on call, and there is a region lead who is supposed to be either coordinating the effort if it's if it's non-trivial, or um, we are having. Um, we are doing also the um, root cause analysis of issues, so the issue wouldn't happen next time again with the same root cause. Um, we don't currently cover um, weekends, and uh, we are using a tool which is called PagerDuty, and it's, it's a very nice tool because you can set up the escalation strategies. You can, you can, you can, as you can see here. So, for instance, this particular strategy works in the way that that uh, you know. Primary gets paged. If he doesn't react within 15 minutes, it gets its to the secondary. If he's not, not reacting, he's, he's going back to the primary. And if he's not reacting, after 45 minutes, it goes paging everybody, right? So we have certain um, you know, uh, assurance that actually it gets, uh, it gets looked at. Um, within these eight hours, uh, within the shift, uh, we are having multiple engineers. And given that you are getting interrupted quite, quite often, if there are a lot of alerts, um, there are only a certain time in this eight-hour shift when uh, somebody is primary, let's say four hours, something like this, uh, because you cannot get focused more than uh, four hours. You need to go for a lunch or something. And so uh, we are having different uh, kind of allocations for, uh, for the period for the primary. And we are going from APEC to EMEA to North America, so we covered all day. So how actually the alert looks like, if you are getting paged, if something critical goes on in the cluster, um, the pager duty notification looks like this. Uh, this one is uh, the EBS alert. So you know some AWS volume got stuck, so we need to manually untouch it because um, it doesn't work uh, anymore. And the good thing is we are having automatism, uh, which is saying, uh, like, hey, there is this alert over here. 
but you don't know uh, out of out of the on top of your head all the time how to fix that, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, for every single monitoring alert, we are having the link uh, to the standard oper operational procedures mm -hmm. over here. So even if you are not feeling well, you can't remember, you're having fully documented way how to actually handle that such issue. So uh, standard operation procedures look like this, and they are having quite a nice format because uh, we are using at the moment just the ASCII doc uh, in, uh, in GitHub. So we can share it uh, among the team. And uh, what I'm trying to say now uh, is what we are doing uh, if we don't get any escalations. Because you see there's only one or two engineers who, who are actually primary or secondary, and the other guys are doing completely something different. So they are watching the queue. So if we have you know, some uh, questions from the second, second level support, uh, CE, uh, we are having uh, agile um, development meetings um, to handle some longer term issues, uh, which is more or less related to reduction of the toil. And we are developing our own tools uh, to reduce you know, the pace of duties or, or alerts, and so that actually we can use memes or we can see the memes on the internet in the meantime while well, everything is automated. <laughs> and okay, so in order to see that something is wrong with a particular cluster, uh, we need to do some monitoring. Uh, at the moment we are using very simple setup. We are having a monitoring container running on the master, and um, it basically looks like this, that there is a cron tap, very long cron tap like this. Right? Uh, why we don't use systemd timers, uh, it's very simple because at one single uh, uh, you know, cron tap, you see the probes here and also the, the pace of the probe. So in one single flight file, uh, it gives you quite easy idea how, how it's going to be uh, executed. And uh, this particular probe, uh, when it's triggered, for instance, like not enough disk space or something like that, um, it goes to our monitoring system, which is uh, our state-of-the-art as a big monitoring system. Uh, we try to move to Prometheus. Uh, it has been future for us, uh, but unfortunately, it seems to be uh, future every time for us <laughs> uh, because we are having some templating in Zabbix, uh, which um, actually handles uh, the mapping uh, of some particle alert to the standard operat operating procedure. So it's not, re not real effort to move somewhere else. Okay. So now I'm going to talk something uh, about the tool, which will uh, uh, allow us to simplify the workflow. And uh, such tool uh, is uh, used for uh, running scripts or uh, Ansible playbooks directly out of the document from the uh, from the Ansible, uh, sorry, from from the standard operation procedure. So if you have a script like this, for instance. You need to do a lot of cut and pasting, right? So it's, it's very prone to human error, and it's not really good to uh, go by line, cut and paste, and so on, uh, because there might be some typesetting issues. Uh, and so um, we have implemented a very simple tool uh, that actually takes the script, runs it for you, and audits the execution and the logs out of the cluster, how it's executed there for later reference. And uh, I was thinking how to name that tool, because uh, if you go uh, I made a list of <laughs> of, uh, of long utilities I have on my system, which you know ABRT actually won. It's I don't know like 50 letters, and I was thinking uh, that it might make sense to name it something like this when you have only a couple of letters because you will execute it quite often. Right? So because we are OpenShift SRE, I call call it O3. <laughs> so it's a really minimalistic name, and so uh, I'm now going to do. Uh, live uh, demonstration of the tool, how actually uh, some stuff might be executed on a particular cluster. Um, this tool, what it does, it looks for uh, ASCII doc documentation. Uh, you give it a topic, it will give you a full text search. It you will point you to a particular part of the, of the operation procedure and also adds you the attack uh, in which you have git hash uh, of the procedure so you can refer, even if the, in the future the procedure changes, you will still know which kind of file you were referring to at a particular time. So, live demo, let's try it. So imagine a situation that actually you are uh, patching a cluster. So at the moment I'm having a KVM cluster, which is OpenShift 3.11. I have one master and one node here. And I'm going to, uh, <laughs> I hope not breaking it. Um, so imagine my task is now to perform, let's say, the upgrade of the cluster, right? So I'm going to do this. Um, so I'm going to do upgrade. And gives me some full text search on the top and then uh, exact match in, uh, in the chapters uh, in the standard operation procedure. 
uh, as you see, we are, we are having a lot of stuff in there, so um, it's, it's very uh, convenient to have some automated tool. Um, so if I want to upgrade, perform an upgrade of uh, 3.9 to 3.11, uh, it allows me to browse through the uh, subchapters of the standard operation procedure, and the little asterisk uh, means here uh, that it contains some script within it. Right? So if I see this one, and I went through the overview and prerequisites, uh, it allows me to do the upgrade steps, which is like this. And the first of these is, let's say, uh, clinic up slash var. So if I go to the chapter, um, you see there is a script over there. And it generates um, uh, th that script out of the SOP, uh, standard operation procedure, in here. And so if we have a quick look into that script, um, it comments out the documentation, so you, so you still have a context, what you are doing. And given that we are not going to run this on the AWS, but we are going to run this directly on, on the cluster I have in KVM, I will do something like this. Uh, yeah, let's, let's get rid of these spaces. So it's kind of, you know, very trivial cleanup, you know, if you want to just be sure that the etcd won't fail. And so uh, the O3 tool uh, was the tool for just getting the script directly out of, the, uh, of your standard operation procedure. And now we are having O3 run tool, which specifies on which kind of uh, cluster uh, you want to run this, and which kind of uh, script you want to run, th run there. I think I might uh, want to rename this one to something else. So let's say clean var, not a sage. And let's run it. So O3R master clean var. And basically, it, it executes the script on the, on the master uh, and gives me the, the output of it. It's OK. There is no such file directory. That's perfectly fine. Uh, because uh, now I'm going to describe that actually I wanted to clean, clean up var. And what the, what the, uh, the running tool wrapper actually did uh, was that actually it created the Git repository, or it added uh, some stuff into uh, the audit repository. So if you have a look here, what is, what is here, uh, we are having a bunch of nodes. Let's say the master and node. And within the master, uh, we are having uh, the history of execution, which is simple. Uh, here is the script, and here is the log. And so if you do git, git log, uh, you see the history. And so if I do git show, Then I can see that I executed this particular script, you know, with this output there, and it also gives me the time of that script when it was executed. So, uh, for instance, if an alert gets triggered after uh, this script, uh, I'm having evidence what I've done. So, an engineer after me, after handover to North America, he has a clear evidence what I've done, and so uh, he knows how to roll it back later on. Um, we are having a lot of uh, scripts, or uh, we are having a lot of uh, Ansible playbooks. Uh, and so not only the, uh, the best scripts, which is more or less for ad hoc uh, kind of execution of, of stuff. And so if I, for instance, uh, we had the recent issue when the source report uh, was uh, in the old version on the clusters. And so the, the second level report cannot, rep uh, cannot create the crash logs, because it was very uh, demanding on the present volume size. Uh, but in your version, it got fixed. So we need to just fix it. And so we are having a very simple operation procedure here, uh, which is saying this. So if you don't want to read all the stuff, uh, we you can just run the playbook. And so uh, if you have just such a simple playbook like this, uh, it again generates um, the script like this. So I think if I go slash temp, uh, move that script to uh, Sociamo, for instance. Then I can run uh, another uh, script, which is O3 uh, run Ansible. And I will run this on master and the node, so on the whole cluster in my setup. And I will put the, the script in there, or you know the uh, Ansible playbook. And 
Maybe let's do this uh, verbose. So now on simple runs, um, it does um, you know, the uh, upgrade of the source utility on the cluster, uh, just in case it needs to be upgraded. And uh, unfortunately, we are having YAM, which is very slow. We don't have uh, DNF in, uh, in RHEL 7 yet. Uh, so it will, so will take a while. Uh, but the good thing is that both of uh, the playbook that was run at the time and the script or the, the output, the log from it, is actually audited. It's, uh, it's stored in the, in the git log. So I will just put there upgrade source. And now if we have a look again into the O3 audit directory uh, and we show uh, what, what's stored there in, in my last change, uh, we see uh, that there is this playbook there is the output from, from Ansible, so it got uh, upgraded or both nodes. And um, why actually there is a distinguish, um, distinguishing uh, between the, the nodes in the cluster. Um, so uh, if I'm just interested, if I'm getting a page or alert that actually node is broken for some reason or master is broken, so I can go directly to the directory of the master and check what has been done at what time and what might be triggering the, the, the problem. So I can roll it, back, roll it back later. So that was just a quick demonstration uh, what, what's been done. And there are a couple of uh, other things which might want to get improved in that tool. Uh, and that is you know, uh, understanding the uh, cluster ID and AWS account, for instance. Um, we are moving also to Azure and, uh, and Google Cloud Platform. So um, at the moment, we are having a very big exposure to AWS, but it will not last very long, I believe. Uh, and also um, giving extra uh, information uh, about you know, allowing to running from the jump host, for instance. And uh, one thing which might be interesting, because sometimes if you write down your uh, operational procedures, sometimes you make error, right? You make a human error, typo in the script or something. So whenever you run it, uh, you have a problem because um, uh, it's broken, you need to fix it again because of um, very stupid error. And so it would be quite nice to have a Jenkins job which actually uh, does uh, predict tests on the SOPs so it doesn't break on the test cluster. Um, and that will assure uh, that you are going to get uh, consistent standard operation procedures by automatic testing. So uh, that was basically all I wanted to say. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And just in case you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yep. Yes, uh, this, is a, this is a very good question uh, because whenever we have a thing that actually is undocumented, we need to document. <laughs> so, uh, it, right, so basically, if there is an emergency we don't know, it's which is not yet documented. Um, okay, I will start from the monitoring, right? We are having only a set of monitoring probes, right, which you monitor. But if we realize that actually there is an additional thing we need to monitor, we need to add it to our monitoring system and to write it to the standard operational procedure, right? And then uh, whenever the probe is getting triggered, uh, you know, you get that page uh, on your cell phone that actually refers to the, to the standard operation procedure. So in time of publishing of the monitoring uh, uh, probe, we need to have also the, um, the standard operational procedure. Yeah. Uh, did I answer your question? If I don't, you know, feel free to ask again, you know, something else. <laughs> Come for clarification. Okay, okay. So uh, that's, the, that's, by the way, a very, very nice question because we are having only limited set of monitoring probes, so we need to decide what we actually monitor. But after the upgrade, it might happen that we are having something we, we don't monitor and it's super relevant, right? So in such a case, uh, there will likely uh, not be a page on your phone or something, but there will be a request from second level support saying, hey, we need to monitor this stuff because the customer is unhappy, he cannot run his pods, right? And after that, we need to develop, you know, the monitoring probe and the standard operation procedure. Yes. Also, very good question. Um, I was thinking about one single thing. Uh, Red Hat de develops stuff in order to be open source, right? So at some point, it would be very, very nice if we open source the standard operation procedure. So can basic, you can basically use them yourself uh, for maintaining your own clusters, right? Because later on, you can actually contribute to us, you know, with the fixes. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry, we are already out of time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>